One prophecy update um, that I forgot to speak about. Um, I just told you that Israel had their, as far as military goes, their greatest exercise they've ever had in the history of Israel. Preparing for taking out the centrifuges in Iran to stop the nuclear threat. Did you know that? It happened just at the end of this last month, the beginning of this month, just a week ago. One of the things I forgot to tell you, because that's preparation for Psalms 83. We believe here as we teach through prophecy that what's going to happen is that Israel, because they cannot afford for Iran to become nuclear, because they have declared when they do, they will wipe Israel from the face of the map. So that the clock is ticking, as it were. And so they've had this exercise with all of their military forces practicing to go in and take out as it were, the centrifuges. Now, I find it interesting that this new movie that's out, Top Gun, Top, Top Gun Maverick, well, you know what they're doing there in that movie? They're taking out the centrifuges in Iran. The whole movie's based, even Hollywood gets it. How much more should the church? But here's the interesting thing I didn't tell you last time. You know, we're moving toward a one-world economy Listen, the rights of America are being stripped away. Israel's on the rise. All of these things are falling into place. But one of the things in this exercise that they practiced, and by the way, the exercise was called the chariots of fire. One of the things that they practice is taking out, along with Iran, the ring of fire. That's what they're calling it. You know what the ring of fire is? It's those 10 nations mentioned in Psalms 83 that radicalized during the Arab Spring that have called for the destruction of Israel. So not only do they practice taking Iran because they know if they do, then these, what we've been talking about in prophecy, will rise up and try to defend Iran by attacking Israel. That's Psalms 83. And when the smoke settles and the dust clears, as it were, God alone will have rescued Israel and the whole world will know it. We're living on the precipice of that. Are you not excited? How many new, 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 new body? Yeah. How many want a mansion that you don't have to pay for? How many want to travel at the speed of thought and not having to pay $6.49 a gallon for gas? Amen. How many want to be able to see the one who loves you face to face? Yeah. Soon. We might have to probably start singing that song soon and very soon. We're going to see the king. We used to sing it back in the hippie days when I got saved. Remember Andre Crouch? I remember Andre Crouch. Soon and very soon. Well, listen. It's soon. Amen. Hey, we start the book of Philippians this morning. We're going to do the introduction. At least we're going to try to do the introduction. It's one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Some of you laugh. It's my favorite because we're in it right now. But it's an interesting epistle. Four chapters, 104 verses, 2,183 words. It is concise. It is condensed. But this particular epistle of Paul has no correction involved. Oh, other than in chapter 4, where he deals with two ladies fighting in the church. But that never happens in other churches, just in the first century. He just has to correct them, calm down, you know, stop, put your claws back in, love one another. But other than that, there are no doctrinal issues that he has to deal with. Many have said it is a letter, as it were, back to the family. Because we're going to see this morning as we look at the history of the birth of the church of Philippi, the theme of the book, and just kind of get the introduction concerning it, we're going to see that the church of Philippi from the very inception was one who supported Paul's ministry. Over five times they sent to him an offering that they'd taken up. And this wasn't a very wealthy church. But they were invested, as we're going to see in Paul's ministry, they were invested as a church in the preaching of the gospel. And they saw Paul not only as their pastor, although Epaphroditus takes his place, but as their missionary. And so when the scene opens, we're going to find out that Epaphroditus has come once and again to, to visit Paul to see how he's doing. He traveled from Philippi to Rome. Paul will be writing this letter from a Roman prison somewhere about 61 A.D., and Epaphroditus is there, and he will take the letter back, as it were, uh, to Philippi so that they can be encouraged. There's just this, we're going to see this sense of camaraderie. But I think of all of the epistles of Paul concerning the time we're living in, this is very important. The theme of this letter, listen carefully, the theme of this letter is the all, write this down, get your note and pad, pad and paper out, your pen. This is important. Because we need to see this today in the church with all the difficulties going on around us. You've got to understand, this is a time when persecution is amping up against the church. 
In fact, I visited the areas of Galatia three years ago up in, uh, up in Cappadocia, the parts where you leave Tarshish. I got to visit Paul's home. They uncovered it there in Tarshish, up through the Taurus Mountains, over through Derby and Lystra and Iconium, over to Antioch Presidia. We'll look at that. And from Antioch Presidia, we're going to see this morning that Paul was directed to the Holy Spirit for the first time to take the ministry out of Asia Minor into Europe. And the first church is planted there in Europe is the church of Philippi. We're going to look at that this morning. But the theme of the book, running through all four chapters, all 104 verses, all 2,183 words, is the, is the all-sufficiency of Christ in every conflict and in every circumstance. That Christ is sufficient. That His grace is sufficient. That His peace is is overwhelming, that his strength is incomparable. And all we need to do is keep our minds stayed upon him. In all four chapters, he's going to tell us that we are to remember something. All four chapters, he's going to bring us back and remind us of something that we should already know. It's like Peter said, we don't so much need to be taught as, as reminded of the things that we should already know. And so in all four chapters, he's going to focus us back on the conversion, back onto that time where Christ worked in our hearts, back on the things of the Lord. So he's going to say that we should remember in all four chapters. He's also going to say that we should think in all four chapters. Think on these things. If it's noteworthy, if it has good report, he's going to talk about thinking on things. And then he's going to also talk about forgetting things, forgetting those things that are behind and so he's going to tell us to think about things that are ahead, forget those things that are behind, remember what Christ has done for you. So that's kind of the theme, as it were, of the letter. So let's not turn right first to chapter 1, verse 1, but let's back up to Acts chapter 16. I want you to see this morning, as we do the introduction to this particular epistle, how the church was birthed. I find it miraculous. I find it intriguing I find it as an example and a model to any New Testament church that we should follow. I believe the church today should be firmly standing upon the authority of God's Word because we believe that it is inerrant, we believe that it is inspired, we believe it's authoritative, but we also believe that it is sufficient. Which means once you release the Word of God, it is sufficient, like Hebrews chapter 4 tells us, to go right down into the very heart of a man to convert them, to save them, to change them, to work in them. So we believe that the Word of God is the foundation for everything we build on. But we also believe that it is the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us into all truth. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts men of sin and of righteousness and of the judgment that is to come. It is the Holy Spirit, that paracletus, that partner that Jesus said He would send to us after the resurrection, after he ascended to his Father, to stand at the right hand of the Father, to ever defend us and make intercession for us, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. The paracletus, para means come alongside, and cletus means one who girds up, protects, comforts. We have that. So we believe that we need the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need the baptism. We need all of the defense and gifts and discernment. We're going to see that as we walk our way through this particular epistle. It's all-encompassing. But we find in Acts chapter 16, we'll begin our reading in verse 6, because as we come to verse 6, Paul now has headed out on his second missionary journey. He makes his way up to his home city, Tarshish. Like I said, I've been there. And they've uncovered, as it were, the home they found writings that relate to the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, in this particular home that connect him and his family. And, and it's really interesting because they had to dig it down, and they built this framework over the top of it. And so you're walking over this glass framework, and you're looking down into Paul's home. Kind of like what God must have done when he, when he chose Paul. He looked down into his home. I thought that there's the well out front. There's the well of Paul, the Roman road that leads from there to Jerusalem. is right out front of his house. But as it were, he leaves there with Silas. You remember there was an argument between him and Barnabas over taking John Mark, the second missionary, and they, there was a division there. And, and Barnabas took John Mark and went one way, and Paul takes Silas and goes another way. So we're going to see that Paul and Silas, they set out. And they go up through the Taurus Mountains. Interesting. One of these days I'll show you pictures or I'll put a um, kind of a scrapbook out there for you to see. Blew my mind. Because when you leave 
Tarshish, and you head up through the Taurus Mountains up to Derby, Lystra, Iconium. It's like leaving Sacramento and going to, to Lake Tahoe. There's snow-covered mountains there. There are pine trees. And you work your way up this windy road, and the first city you come to is Derby, and then Lystra, then Iconium, and then you shoot a ways over, as we did, to Antioch, Presidia. That's where we're going to find Paul trying to make a decision which way to go, and the Holy Spirit leads him, as it were, to Philippi. But when they're in Lystra, they pick up another one of their ministers, young Timotheus, Timothy. His grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, had trained him well in the scripture. His father was a Greek. Most theologians believe that he had passed away. He's not in the scene. And so Paul just takes Timothy, circumcises him because he had a Greek father and a Jewish mother, just so he wouldn't offend. He'd become all things to all men that he might save some. And so now we have the third of this group. You have Paul. You have Silas. You have Timothy. And we're going to see they come to Antioch Presidia. Antioch Presidia is beautiful. I mean, it's like being on one of those mountains in Lake Tahoe. You, you're surrounded, as it were, by these snow-covered mountains. It's gorgeous. And from there, as he's done ministering, he's praying. That's where we kind of pick it up. Let's read it and so that I get it right. He said, now when they had gone through Phrygia, the regions of Galatia, uh, for the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in Asia, forbid them. Paul is in Antioch Presidia now. There, there's the three of them. They picked up Timothy. Paul wanted to go south, and we took that road from Antioch Presidia south down to Ephesus. In fact, when you go down that road, and we took it on one of the buses that we were on, we took that road down there, and literally down away from, just a few miles south of Antioch Presidia, lies this beautiful lake that looks just like Lake Tahoe. They should build a resort there. It's gorgeous. And then you make your way on down to Ephesus. And so as they're there in Antioch Presidia, they're praying. And, and they want to go down to Asia. They want to go south toward Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit said no. Listen, what I want to tell you as we look at this, sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to say no. In your life, in my life. Sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to shut a door that is needed to be shut. And too often, we're trying to kick that door open that God has shut. We shouldn't do that. If God shuts the door, leave it shut because he has a better door for you to go through. So Paul is with him and said, okay, the Holy Spirit says we can't go south. Then let's go north up into Bithynia. And again, the Holy Spirit suffered them not to go. No. So now you got a door shut to the left and a door shut to the right. And this is what you need to do. Whatever direction you were headed in, however God was leading you, if you want to take a left and that door is shut, if you want to take a right and that door is shut, then just continue on the course. Further information will come. Just like when he called Philip, Philip out of that revival in Samaria down to a desert crossroads. Can you imagine? He's in the desert. There's no reason to be there. And here comes a chariot. There's an Ethiopian eunuch on there that just purchased the scroll of Isaiah, which would have been at high cost. Couldn't understand it. Was in the section speaking of Jesus. Philip runs up and says, hey, you understand what you're reading? <laughs> no, join me. Hops up on the wagon. Explains to him that Jesus was the Messiah. That's what you just witnessed back in Jerusalem. And then the Holy Spirit, after he baptized this guy, translate him, beam me up and beamed him 27 miles away. We don't find Philip again till later when he has daughters who are prophetesses. But when the gospel finally reached Ethiopia, they found over 100,000 believers because a, a man was willing to be directed of the Holy Spirit. This is the scene before us this morning. As Paul says, the door to the left, south to Ephesus is closed. The door to the right, north up to Bithynia is closed. Let's just stay moving in this direction. Further information will come. And when he gets to Troas, read this here. And they passed through Mycenae and came down to Troas. What is waiting for them in Troas? A doctor named Luke. And they have a vision there. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia praying unto him saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after, we had seen, after he had seen the vision, immediately we. If you read in the text up to that point, 
as Luke is recording, and by the way, Acts and Luke are recorded by this doctor to send back to his master, Theophilus. As Paul comes to Troas, no doubt, you know, with his eye problems and his health problems and the malaria that he had contracted on his first missionary journey, he's in pretty bad shape. And there was this notable official named Theophilus. And in those days, notable officials had their own private physicians. You couldn't trust the public, you know, medical community. You had your own private guy. He lived with you. And so as the spirit moves on Theophilus, he gives Dr. Luke to Paul. And then Paul, while they're in Troas, now they pick up Luke. So you got Paul and you got Silas. You got Timothy. You got Luke, man. You got the four horses of the apocalypse, man. You got, you got guys who are shakers and movers. You got guys, it's going to be said, that they turned the world right side up with the gospel. Every city they went to. And so Luke, being the physician, being the detailed guy that he is, he will put pen to paper and record the acts of the apostles as he follows Paul. He'll write back to Theophilus a gospel as he interacts with the other apostles called the gospel of Luke. And so they pick up Luke there, and it's interesting. They have a vision, at least Paul does, of a Macedonian man. Now, what you're going to find out is when he gets over to Philippi, it wasn't a man at all. It was a woman. She was a seller of purple from Thyatira named Lydia. And she becomes the first convert on the European continent as the gospel leaves Asia for the first time. Let's read on. And it says, and, and, and we endeavor to go to Macedonia, surely gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. We know, as the Spirit is leading, that it's time now to leave Asia Minor, to move over for the first time uh, into Europe, into, you know, the areas of what we would call today Greece. And he says, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came straight course to Samotracia and the next day to Neapolis. Now, this is interesting because we're going to find out later in this particular epistle that when they return, it takes them five days to cross the same sea they crossed in two. I would offer your, for your suggestion that if God is in it, he opens doors. If God is in it, it, it seems like the wind is at your back. Your cells are full, as it were, and he just moves you where he needs you to be. Uh, many times, if you're not in the will of God, it can be a rough road. Oh, you can still tack back and forth and do your best to try to get where you want to go, but it's difficult. And so we see here that as they loose there from Troas, they come quickly to the seashores there of Europe for the first time. And from thence Philippi, which is a chief city. Now, this is a Roman colony. In fact, if you read the history of Philippi, you'll find out that most of the Roman soldiers, Roman generals, Roman officials had settled in there to retire. In fact, we're going to see in the text this morning, there was less than 10 Jewish men, because if there were more than 10 Jewish men, they were required to build a synagogue. And we're going to find there was no synagogue in Philippi. In fact, Paul has to go out to their, the riverside there um, to find some people praying. And there is where he meets Lydia. So he said on the Sabbath, he went out of the city by the riverside where to pray, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and we spake unto a woman who resorted there. This is an entrepreneur. Uh, she's probably by the river washing the garments, getting them ready to dye. We're going to see in a few moments that she was a seller of purple. And that particular dye came from a sea, uh, well, it was a, a shellfish. And it had a dye in it, and you could get about maybe a drop out of squeezing out of each one of these shellfish. And it took a lot of effort to get a little bit of dye, and it was very expensive. Because all those uh, Roman soldiers' uniforms, that red dye, the scarlet, it comes from this particular product. And so she's a seller of it. So she's there by the riverside praying, and, and no, no doubt working her trade. And he says, a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart was opened by the Lord. Listen, um, John chapter 6, verse 44 says, no man can come to the Father unless he draws him. I think that's an important point. See, because it's not our job. I want you to listen carefully to me this morning. It's not our job to bring people to Christ. It's not our job to open people's hearts to the gospel. 
It's not our job to make converts. I think the church has labored hard and long in doing something they were never called to do. If you have somebody that's not saved, if you have somebody that is opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ that is stubborn, then you pray. Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. God has to open their eyes to that convicting work of the Spirit. That's why we trust the work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. You may be here this morning and not saved. I don't know. We've got like 19 satellite churches. We're in 25 different countries. We've got a huge audience out there in cyberland. Some of them listen this morning may not be saved. And there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to convince you unless the Holy Spirit has already done the work in your heart. Pray. Pray that God would open people's hearts. Listen, somebody was praying for me 46 years ago when I stumbled into that Bible study stone one night on the very eve I was going to commit suicide and God opened my heart. I felt it. I knew it. I experienced it. I know what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 is all about. Because when that guy began to share the gospel, it was though God ripped open my heart. I had no defense against it. It was going right down into the very pain of my heart and dealing with the issues of my life. And I knew that I knew at that moment. I had to make a decision. And this decision I'm going to make is going to determine the rest of my life 46 years ago. This woman, as she's hearing Paul speaking the gospel there at that riverside, her heart is opened by the Spirit. It's open so that the Word of God can go in. Now, we're not called to bring people to Christ. We're not called to make converts, but we are called to take Christ to people. Paul was called by the Spirit to leave his comfort zone of Asia Minor, go into Europe that he'd probably never traveled there before, He's wandering around. And he thinks, well, maybe the best thing to do is the Holy Spirit's leading us go up to Philippi. It's the major city in the area. There's not even 10 Jewish men there. There's no synagogue, but we'll go down by the river. And no doubt Paul just stands up and begins to preach the gospel. There are people doing laundry. There are people doing all kinds of things down by the river. You got to understand, they weren't necessarily honoring Sabbath because they were, it was mainly Gentiles. But there is a woman there who is a Jewish convert, who is down there, and she listens, and God opens her heart. She's the first convert of Europe, this woman named Lydia. And when she was baptized with her household, baptism in those days, not like we do it here. I, we do it here as in a, a separate event. In those days, if you got saved, instead of coming down and praying a prayer, like we do, come on down and we'll pray a prayer with you. You'll see Christ. They took you over and they let you tell the people, I'm saved. I'm born again. Jesus got home. And then they baptized you right there on that day to show that the old man is dead and the new man's alive. You put off the old man, you put on the new man, and you're going to put away everything of this world and you're going to walk for Jesus. It was a public admission that you now belong to the Lord. And so she was baptized, and it says that her family had come to faith too, so they must have been there with her. And she begs them that she should abide in her house. Now, she's a good salesman. She convinces them, convinces Paul to come to her house. And it came to pass that when, um, when they went to prayer, get this, a certain damsel possessed of the spirit of divination. See, you can expect, this is introduction, listen, but you can expect, if God's about to do something, you can expect there's going to be spiritual resistance. We just came out of Ephesians chapter 6, talking about spiritual warfare, right? So if God is about to use you to do something, and God's about to use Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke to plant a church that for the next 18 years as it were, will partner with Paul, that will support Paul, that will encourage Paul, that will be a shining light in all of Europe, who will never buy into false doctrine or never leave the faith, that will be just a shining light, then you can expect there's going to be resistance. In fact, when Paul came to Ephesus, we know that that town was given over to witchcraft and demonology. In fact, when they were getting saved there, that they burned books over a million dollars current price of books. And I got to be there in Ephesus. I got to be in the marketplace where they burned the books. 
denouncing witchcraft. And Paul said, I know that an effectual fervent door of ministry was open for me at Ephesus. Why? Because my adversaries are many. Listen, church, you need to buck up, cupcake. If you're going to do something for the Lord, it's going to cost you something. There's going to be warfare. He didn't tell you to put the armor on. We just read last week. So you can go to a parade. So you want to buff it up and shine it up. And you want to look good. You want to look like those Marines, man, in their dressed uniforms. No, no, no. Put the fatigues on. Get the gun. Put the backpack on and go to battle. Amen? We're in a war. And it's for the souls of men. And so here Paul tells us, Every time he went down to pray, every time he went down to minister at the river because there was no synagogue there, this lady would follow him around. Now, some have said, and some have thought, and some commentaries have written, said, well, you know, she, she was really kind of, even though she was filled with a demon, she was kind of being used of God. No, she wasn't. She wasn't saying, there's two ways you can say things. She wasn't saying, listen, guys, these are the true men of God. I'm the fake. I'm the phony. They're the real. I'm a false prophetess. <laughs> They're the real thing. Listen to them. They tell you about the Most High God. That's not how she was saying it. No doubt she was saying it. Yeah, right. These guys call themselves apostles of the real God. Yeah, right. They tell you that they have the way of life. Yeah, right. She was mocking Paul. Now, Paul put up with it for a little bit. But finally, we're going to see he turns and he casts this spirit of divination out of her, which brought her master much gain through soothsaying. The same followed Paul and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, in a mocking way, which show us the way of salvation. And she did this many days. You know, I'm very interested in Paul's endurance. Man, if I knew that I had the power to do that, if I were Paul back then, I would have done it. I'd have got rid of it. You know, listen, no time to mess around. But he waited many days, maybe so there would be a crowd gathered so that they could see the power of God over demonic forces. And Paul, being grieved, turned and said unto the Spirit, not to the woman, to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, and the same hour. The idea in the Greek is the very same moment, that nanosecond when the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus was put over this lady's life, that demonic force left her. And when her master saw, so there was something notable about it, that their hope of gain was gone, uh, they caught Paul and Silas. They drew them to the marketplace with the rulers, and they besought them, uh, the besought the magistrates, saying, these men being Jews. This is a Roman colony. We're all pagan here. And kind of like where we live today. This is a Roman colony. These, we're all pagans here. We're not Jews. They capture thee. These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe being Romans. And in Athens, they had a law as Rome ruled in that area that if you introduce any other God, you'll be put to death. That's why Paul, when he was on Mars Hill, brought to their attention the unknown God, the one you worship in ignorance. Let me tell you about him because he didn't want to be executed. And so now they're in trouble. And some of us would say, really, God, you led me here. You called me here. You gave me the authority to cast out this demon, and now we're in trouble. Well, what's the trouble they get into? And they teach customs not lawful for us to receive. And the multitude rose up against them. How many felt like the multitude has risen up against you? And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes, not a few, but many. In fact, the Greek words here is that they flayed them. They literally removed the skin and flesh from their back. They thoroughly beat them. And after they were done beating them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. It wasn't just in any prison. In the Greek grammar, it says it's the lower part of their prison. Each jail in those days had three levels. They were put in the dungeon. We're going to see in a few moments, not only were they put into the dungeon, but their feet were strapped to a beam. That's what they would do. And they would stretch out your back with chains. And so the back that they just laid open is now laying on that dark, dank, damp floor with all of whatever is on that floor. And you're in miserable pain. Now, now watch this. I, I find this interesting because this is all so important in what God is doing to birth this church. And so we see that they had beaten them, and they fast their feet fast to stalks. And at the midnight 
hour, Paul and Silas began to complain. They were murmuring. You know, God, I, I thought I was in the center of your will. I gave my life to serve you, and now this, really? Uh, not, you know, I've been beat. Now I'm in this prison. Not just in the prison, I'm under the prison. I'm chained. My back is aching. I can't sleep. I'm in excruciating pain. So in the midnight watches, when they could not sleep, they prayed. And they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Listen, people are watching you. You are an epistle read of all men. It's easy to serve the Lord in good times. But this world is watching you, Christian. Watching me as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. It's a proclaimer of the gospel. They're not going to watch me in the good times. They're going to watch me in the difficult times. Is your God truly sufficient? Is he all sufficient in every circumstance, in every conflict? Do you trust him when you're going through the valley, as it were, of the shadow of death? Do you trust him when your life is, as it were, or as it seems to be, falling apart? where you can make no logical conclusion about what is happening. In your mind, your heart, it shouldn't be happening. Why is this happening? Lord, you directed me here by the Spirit. You gave me a vision. You put together a team. We've had our first convert here. Why am I suffering like I'm suffering? Why am I now in prison? Did I cross over into Europe to be put in a prison? To be beaten and flailed? To be laying here in the midnight Hours where I can't sleep in excruciating pain. And they begin to cry out and they begin to pray. And they begin to sing. And the others are taking note. I'm going to tell you, we're living. This is why it's so important we look at the introduction. We're living in a time where people are freaked out. The people that we live around in this community that don't know the Lord are in fear of what's coming. They understand that this current administration is going to get us into war with this foreign policy. It's going to cause us to not be able to function economically here as it strips away the energy and the independence of our energy. We're going into a food shortage. We know that. My, my minor in secular college was agriculture. There's a food shortage coming. Uh, we're living in a very stressful time. Would you agree? If you, if you agree, say amen. Okay. What does this world need to see? It needs to see a church. It needs to see a Christian that's unwavering in their faith. That has a trust in an all-sufficient God. That understands that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And it doesn't matter what condition or position we find ourselves in. We're going to sing his praise. We're going we're to worship him because we trust him. We are... We're going to see, if we get to the first chapter of Philippians, this is, already, this is an introduction. If we get there, we're going to see that he's going to pray that there, there are three things happen in them. That they are built upon the solid foundation of God's word. That they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that they're trusting in the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, that's going to be the greatest testimony when your neighbors are freaking out. What's going to happen? You can say there's a God in heaven who rules in the affairs of men. And one of his great promises, and Paul's going to bring it to the fore in this particular epistle when we get there, is that our God shall supply all of our needs in heavenly places. See, his economy is not connected to this economy. In heavenly places through Christ Jesus. I don't know how he's going to do it. You see, I don't need to know the how. Listen to me, church. You don't need to know the how. All of us asking how, 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 or, or why. Or when? We ask the wrong questions. It should never be, how are you going to do it? Why are you letting me go through this? When are you going to deliver me? It should be who. I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. Are you persuaded this morning, church? I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed to him 46 years ago. I'm not able to keep it. The devil 
And his hordes are trying to strip it from me. They've come to steal, kill, and destroy. The world's doing its best to corrupt it. But I have a promise that my God is able. Amen? See, you know, when we're reading this, Paul didn't know the rest of the story. Yet, he's just there chained to this beam stretched out on this cold, damp floor suffering. And all he knows to do is to worship, to sing his praises. He knows that there's a God in heaven that hears. And so as he's singing the praises, I think God begins to tap his foot because it was so, man, that's cool. I like that. A little more, Paul. Silas, kind of join in. You, you sing the harmony, Paul. You, you sing the melody. And he begins to tap his foot and an earthquake happens and rocks the prison. Maybe God's about to tap his foot in your life because in the midst of your stuff, he hears you praising him. Watch us. I like this so much. Men, they sang praises to God and the prisoners heard. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands, their chains, fell off. That's quite an earthquake. That's a supernatural earthquake. That's the kind of earthquake God brings into our lives, and we need those kind of earthquakes. Amen? When we're there wondering, Lord, what are you going to do next? I don't know. It's not a how. It's not a why. It's not a when. It's a who. I know in whom I have believed, and I'm just going to worship him. I'm going to worship him. Uh, when I don't understand what's going on, I'm still going to worship him because I know him to be the God that's in control of all things, and he'll just start tapping his foot, and things will start happening, and they did. And all of the prison doors were open. And the keeper of the prison, listen to this, awakened out of his sleep, saying the prison doors were opened. He drew out a sword and was about to kill himself. You understand, there were probably in that lower part of the prison people that were going to be executed for murder. Paul is amongst the worst of the worst down there. And in Roman law, if you were given charge over a prisoner and that prisoner escaped, you, as the Roman soldier that would give him charge, you took his place. This Roman soldier knew that if these men escaped, he would be executed. So he's just going to speed up the process. He's going to execute himself. And as he's preparing now, as it were, to execute himself, Paul cried out, verse 28, with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in. He comes running in. And he came in trembling. He fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do not tell me people aren't watching what you're going through. And seeing how you respond. Because anybody can trust in the good times. It's in the tough times. Solomon said it's better to go to a funeral than a house of feasting. Because a funeral has a more finding effect upon your life. This world is watching. Are we going to be a pillar of truth? Are we going to stand firm in these last days? Are we going to be an example that we can trust the true and living God? That people that are fearful will come and say what this person said. What must I do to be saved? Because I can see that your God is a God of God's. We Romans, we have a lot of them, but none of them can shake the foundation of a prison. None of them can open prison doors. None of them can make the shackles fall off. That's what happened to me 46 years ago. Everything that bound me to this world was loosed in a moment. I was set free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, when we get to chapter 1, verse 1, we'll find out some other things about serving. We're not going to get there this morning. We'll get the introduction done. And I'll tie a knot and it'll make sense. So he cries out, what must I do to be saved? Now listen to verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved and thy house. He didn't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. Like some of our Christian brothers who believe in baptismal regeneration. He didn't say that. He didn't say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and attend church every time the doors are open, pay 10% of your tithes. And if you're really, really righteous, pay 15% and do all of these works. No, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done and you shall be saved. Not only you, but you'll have an influence on your household. And he took him that same hour of the night and washed his stripes and was baptized. Listen, he baptized being 
and all of his straight way. His whole family gets saved. Now we've got Lydia. And now we've got a Roman guard and his entire family. We have a church. And when he brought him to the house, he set meat before him, and they rejoiced, believing in God and all his house. And when the day was come, the magistrates sent their sergeants to let these men go. Okay, we beat you. We put you in prison. We're not going to feed you. Too expensive. Now we're just going to let you go. Watch Paul here. This will all make sense when I tie a knot in it. So beautiful. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, Hey, the magistrates have sent me to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. I like Paul. I, I think that I've got the spirit of Paul. I think I got a little vinegar cursing in my veins too. You know what Paul said? Ain't no way. Ain't no how. Uh-uh. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. See, if you beat a Roman citizen, and Paul was not one who purchased his Roman citizen, he was a freeborn Roman citizen. If you beat him without a trial, whoever did that was to be executed on the spot. Oh, no. No, 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 no. You're not just going to let me go. That ain't how it's going to work. You beat me uncondemned, being a Roman, and have cast me into prison, and now thou thrust us out privately? Nay, no way. Verily, of a truth I say, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. You see, he's from southern Judea. Come and fetch us out. Come and fetch us out. You, you, you threw us in. You beat us. Uncondemned Romans. You come and fetch us out. And the sergeant told his words to the magistrates, and they feared when they heard they were Romans. And they came and besought them, um, besought them and brought them out, desiring that they should depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison. They entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren encouraging and strengthening them, then they were comforted and departed. Here's what I want you to know about the church of Philippi. As Paul doesn't quite understand what the next step is as he's there in Antioch, Presidia. Do I go south? Do I go north? And the Holy Spirit said, no, Paul. You don't get to go to Ephesus. You don't get to go to Bithynia. Just keep going. At that moment, God did not explain to Paul. He did not give him reasons. He just said, trust. And so Paul just keeps going straight. He finds himself in the city of Troas. Still, when he enters the city, he doesn't know why he's there, but he's trusting the Lord. And at night, he has a vision. It's a Macedonian man. It's a man of Europe saying, come over, help us, preach the gospel here. We need your help. And while he's in Troas, not, now he gets further direction while he's in Troas, but while he's in Troas, he meets this man, Theophilus. We're not told much about Theophilus other than Luke writes back to him because Luke was his personal physician. And God says, I know that you need a personal physician, Paul. You're going to need him to give you advice for Timothy and some of the others. So Paul was in Troas because now the fourth member of their party joins Luke. God, in order to put his fingerprints on it, gives him straight course. What would normally take five days to sail takes two. When they get to this Roman colony called Philippi. They go down to the river because there is no Jewish contingency there. there. There's not 10 Jewish males. Paul always went to the Jewish synagogues and preached first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And because there were no Jews, he went down to the river. He's just preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit opens up Lydia's heart. And she's converted her and her household. You see, the Macedonian man ended up being a woman, Lydia. First convert in Europe. And then trouble comes. This woman filled with an evil spirit follows Paul around. Trying to discourage. Trying to defame. Trying to mock, as it were, the message. We pray every Sunday that anything like that would try to come into our church. That it would be met by the Holy Spirit in a parking lot. Either do a U-turn or being brought under control of the Holy Spirit. Because we don't want anything in here to detract from the message. 
That's why we spend a great amount of time, the elders, on Tuesday morning praying for the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and pierce our hearts. We have a group that meets on Thursdays in the morning. And we pray here, intercessors that are praying for you, praying for this church, praying for the influence. We're on a number of radio stations we got, that we know of. 19 satellite churches that tune in with us. We're in 25 different countries. We, we have four downloads from our messages every Sunday, every Wednesday in Iran. Four downloads. We, we don't know if that's one person or if it's a group of people or if it's a Bible study or four pastors. We have seven in China. In places where it's illegal to preach the gospel, the message from this church is going forth. But as the message is going forth, there is resistance. And finally, Paul turns and casts this demonic spirit out of this woman. Instead of people being grateful that this woman was delivered, they caught Paul and Silas and they beat them and they threw them in prison, which was necessary. Here's the rest of the story. It was necessary. It was necessary. Paul will write to them in this letter saying it was necessary that we suffered. Because from that moment on, Paul had leverage. You mess with the church in Philippi and I'll call Rome. And I will tell Rome, you beat a Roman citizen. You beat two Roman citizens, untried, uncharged, without a trial. And Rome will come down here and execute every one of you. You understand me? I think Paul used it. And that church, for the next 15 to 18 years, as far as we can tell, remained loyal to Paul and to his ministry. Five times we're going to read that they brought a gift of support to Paul. Epaphras, the one now that will take the letter back to Philippi, is the pastor there. There's a connection, there's a camaraderie, as it were, as these people are connected to Paul. And thus the birth of the church at Philippi. And Paul will write this letter, it's a letter of endearment, it's a letter of somebody writing to a friend, to a fellow companion, to a, a co-laborer, as it were. It's a letter of endearment. And he's going to tell them in this letter, between 19 and 20 times in one form of another, that you should joy or rejoice in what Christ has done for you. Not in the difficulties, but in what Christ has done for you. He's going to tell them in every chapter, remember what the Lord has done for you. And stop thinking about these things and start thinking about these things. Think on these things. And then he's going to tell us the things we need to forget. Listen, if you're going to go into battle for the Lord, Satan is going to bring up your painful past. Just let me ask you, how many are buffeted with your painful past? Just a few of you. The rest of you just oblivious? I mean, does Satan not mess with you with your painful past? Or he will try to make you fearful of your future. And what Paul will say to these Philippian Christians is, forget those things that are behind. Press for the upper calling. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's your future. And this church will impact. It will be, as it were, uh, the, the mother church like Jerusalem was for Asia Minor, this church will be the foundation for what God does in Europe. And once and again, they will come and they will encourage Paul. What a one, led of the Spirit, controlled of the Spirit, understanding that all things are working together for good, even the beatings and the imprisonments to those who love God are called according to His purposes. All of these things working together to birth this church. And Paul will say, as he writes back to them, he was glad to suffer for their, for their cause and for their sake. Amen.